What's hey, up? Hey. How are you? I'm doing great. How about yourself? I was getting a little nervous there because I, I didn't see you. So I'm, I'm glad yeah, it was, you're here. It was uh, not going through a couple technical difficulties, I guess. But here we are. Okay, good stuff, good stuff. And it's, and it's, uh, it's Cecil. I was saying Cecile, and I was like, I'm so glad that I asked you before, like, how to say your name. It's very important to pronounce names correctly. Very important. That's right. Yeah. So, so how's it going? I'm good. I'm good. I was just telling the folks here that I don't do a lot of interviews in the morning. So uh, this is actually a break in routine for me, but it's good. It's good to have a little, like, there we go. Good stuff. So there's so much to talk about with you, and uh, I, I want to start out, well, well, actually, let's have you start out. Like, tell us a little bit about yourself, like how you discovered physical uh, training and, and, and nutrition and supplementation and all that. Okay, so um, throughout my whole life in high school, I've always been between 109 and 112 pounds. I could not gain weight. Um, I'd work out, I'd do cardio, whatever it was, and I just, I could not put the weight on. So it's going to be three years now. I started working out and I started getting into bodybuilding and uh, started using supplements with Blackstone Labs. And that was the only way that I was able to put on weight. My max that I got to was about 150 pounds. And um, that was just probably the best that I've ever been as far as fitness wise. Cardio was shit, but I could lift some heavy shit. And, and I was happy about that. And I was, I was proud of that. I was able to develop my body in such a way that I was never able to, to do before. And um, I was taking all kinds of stuff and, you know, testing things out and seeing what was working for me. I felt like it was more of a science experiment, you know, what, what the pros and cons were for each of the things for me personally, because something might work for you really well, but it doesn't work for me, you know, in, in the same way or whatnot. So um, I was dirty bulking. I was literally eating anything and everything that was in my face. Um, people that were around me when I was in Myrtle Beach, they were like, holy shit, what is your food bill? Because I was just pounding food, just trying to put weight on. And um, once I finally got there, it was it was freaking awesome. And then uh, I left for a little while and went to the military. And unfortunately, in the military, you can't just pound food whenever you want and work out and lift weights whenever you want it. So um, I lost a lot of that. And so now I'm back down to 130 pounds. But now I'm back home and in a normal lifestyle so that I can start working out and, and getting to where I want to be again. It's, it's all a work in progress. I mean, I mean, like I said, it's, it's a really fun and cool science experiment in my opinion. No, for sure. For sure. And I'm, I'm again, I'm so happy that you're here because like, like a few seconds before I was like, why is this taking so long? I was asking people to reach out to you and everything. I was getting very, very nervous because I know we were talking, but Instagram's the weirdest thing because like on the Legion <laughs> page, I don't see comments anymore on Legion Live, right. so I do Legion Live and Strength X. Instagram is a fantastic app, but it's 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 got a lot of a lot of issues. But one yeah. of the things you said there too was, you know, what works for you may not work for others, and so I think a lot of times people in the fitness industry they're like, well, I want to look like Corey, or I want to look like Chris Lou, or I want to look like PJ, but right. what they do may not work for you. So you kind of have to find your your like your niche. Exactly. Exactly, and uh, one of my favorite products from Blackstone is the SST one that got me fucking huge. I mean, I was like, holy shit. And everyone's like, oh my God, what are you doing? And I was like, well, I'm in the gym every single day. You know, it did, at, at that point in time, it didn't matter what time I went to the gym because I had a, a regular, you know, lifestyle. But once I, like I said, once I hit the military, it just changed a little bit. Hey, what's up, Todd? So, um, you know, it, it was a little, it was frustrating. Um, it was disappointing. And then Honestly, to get back into it, it was kind of a, a little bit of a mental struggle, to be honest with you, because I was like, shit, I was way up here, and now I'm back down here, and everything I worked for for the past two years is just gone. But that started psyching me out, and the truth of the matter is, is that that's not really how it goes. You know, you have muscle memory, and as soon as you start getting back in there, all of a sudden your muscles are like, I remember this. All right, let's do this again, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, no, sure. that, that part of it is, is really exciting and it's motivating. But I, I did have to talk to myself and, and get myself out of that funk because, I mean, shit, I was at such a, a good spot physically. And then I just, I just lost it, you know? Definitely. But, and I might be waving at people and like people in the yeah, no, you know. you. Todd was saying good morning. But no, and talk to us a little bit about food in the military because I've had uh, 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 Benny was on uh, Amandara's a couple of weeks ago and he was talking about how there's 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 a lot of variety in food, but he just plays it safe. He brings his own. So 
you don't always have an option to bring your own, right? Um, sometimes you do have options and those options are really shitty. Um, Domino's is always there. So is Burger King and Taco Bell. So those are your, you know, alternatives, unless you're going to go to like the commissary and sometimes you don't have time for that. But um, if you're doing field stuff, you know, your option usually is, is an MRE. Now, for those of you that don't know what an MRE is, it's the worst thing anybody can ever give you as far as nutrition wise. For one, it tastes like shit. And for two, you're eating something that has 3000 calories in one bag. Like it has all of these calories and you're eating this three times a day. So you're just putting on unnecessary weight. You're eating unnecessary calories. The amount of preservatives and stuff that are in there, I mean, they're good for like 10 years. So I, I don't think, any, I... yeah. I don't think anybody should be eating something that lasts on a shelf for 10 years. Um, for me personally, it actually gives me a headache. I mean, I'm not much of a junk food eater. Don't get me wrong. I don't eat the best. I love pizza. That's my weakness. Uh, and pasta. I love, I, yeah, I love that stuff. But um, it's just one of those things that it's like, you're putting all this stuff into your body and, and it gives me a headache and it just makes me feel like shit. And so sometimes you didn't have a choice and you were like, man, I'm so freaking hungry. Well, yeah, the peanut butter, the peanut butter is great. Um, and there, there are things in there that you're like, okay, well, I'll eat this, I'll eat this. But for the most part, the actual meals of it, they're terrible. They're terrible for you. They taste like dog food. I mean, it, it's just, it's really hard to keep up with your fitness once you're going through like field trainings and, and you're, you know, just all over the place. It's, it was a really difficult uh, challenge for me, but we're back. Definitely. No, and, and I've always wondered how those MREs stay for so long. I would think sodium or MSG, but you said preservatives. And a lot of times all you do is like you can make them with like a little bit of water and a, like one of those, what is it, butane things? Like, right. And, yeah, right. I'm sure they don't taste very good at all. No, um, they're, they're terrible. Terrible. Yeah. I mean, they, even the prisoners don't get that stuff. You guys are hardcore. You take Right. Showers. Yeah. I mean, they're eating better than we are. You know, they're getting a Isn't hot meal every day, three times a day, and we're out here just eating out of some packaged thing that says it's chicken noodle soup and it's that's not what it is <laughs> right it's but you're keeping america safe and we're so grateful for that i mean really thank truly. you man. i appreciate and, that but your your job especially is you're you're kind of in a tough spot right because you're an army combat medic so medics aren't really firing you're helping like treat the sick and you're still right. getting fired upon though right that's correct. However, uh, being a combat medic and not just a medic, we, we carry firearms as well. Okay. So we're able to, in a situation, we're able to fight back if we need to. But for the most part, yeah, we're the ones going in and dragging people out and, and helping everyone and putting the pieces back together. Right. And, and I mean, if, if, if we were, if this was like, not, not to glamorize, but like, because they were horrible people, but like even in World War II, World War One, these different wars, we were fighting professional armies, and technically they wouldn't fire on medics, but like technically. But now we're fighting like terrorists, and jihadists, and all sorts of unsavory Which characters. Gets they don't have any rules of war; they'll shoot at anything. So it's, that's um, right. I mean, we we have rules and regulations for like medical vehicles and stuff, but I mean, if you think about it, so you're not supposed to shoot a medical vehicle that's labeled as a medical vehicle. But, they but don't care about, right? that exactly that translates to here's a target and shoot the target. Yeah. So, you know, we might abide by those rules, but that doesn't necessarily mean that other people do. Right, right. You know, and, and, and that's the thing too. And again, like with, with, with being a medic as well, I mean, there's no shortage of small arms around the world. And those things, I mean, they, they, they can't bring down a fighter jet or take out a tank a lot of times, but what they can do to the human body, I mean, they, I mean, even like the, the AK round, I mean, that's like a cannon. I mean, that, that, you know, yeah. and it's, and I, and I just think it's, it's, it's uh, what you do is so noble too. And you're putting your life you know, on the line every time you go out to, to help someone, you know, and there's right. wars. I mean, I don't know if you're like officially declared wars, but like Vietnam wasn't officially declared a war and we lost like almost 60,000 there. So, I mean, there's, there's a, a lot of areas around the world where we're needed. And it was crazy is after we help these countries, like they, 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 they want to kick us out. It's like the weirdest. Right. Like, I mean, there's a lot of things also that we don't know the behind the scenes and, and we'll probably never know. No. Um, but that's not here nor there. No, definitely. And then uh, uh, last week I had James Muldrow on here and uh, he's in the Marines and he does embassy duty, which is like, also, I mean, they look so cool, but my gosh, that, that must be like, I mean, I, you know, you gotta be on your feet like 20, you can never relax, I guess, you know? Right. So, right. Yeah. You, you don't really get a break. That's for sure. 
for sure. So how long have you been in the military for, like all, all total? Two years now in total. Nice. Two nice. years and six more to go. Good stuff. Good stuff. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and maybe, maybe that will be it or you'll be like Benny. Benny like supposedly keeps telling his wife that he's done and he keeps re-enlisting and re-enlisting. So. I mean, so I love it. I love the structure of it. Um, there's a lot of different things that we get to do that and as a civilian, you know, you won't experience and whatnot. And we're always doing things with our unit and getting together and, and retraining. And it's just one of those things that it's like constantly changing. And I like the constant change. I like learning new things. I like uh, doing new experiences and stuff like that. So right now I'm going to tell you that I, I, I'm going to see how the next six years plays out because who knows? Um, I don't get into politics, but when elections happen and, and there's new presidents or current presidents, there's so many different things that change and structure with the military change. Like uh, the military, I don't know if you know this, was mandated to get vaccinated. I know that's a, a touchy subject, you know, to get vaccinated, not to get vaccinated. Everybody kind of has their, their looks and beliefs on it. And, you know, oh, it's fake. Oh, no, it's real. We're all going to die if you don't get it. Yada, sure. yada. But um, so in the military, everybody's vaccinated. And if you didn't get vaccinated, it was one of those things where, OK, well, we're going to kick you out. And I mean, there's veterans uh, and uh, people that were about to retire that they were like, I don't want to do it. I'm not taking the job. And you lose all your benefits, you lose everything, which I think is not the right way. But right. I'm not, I don't know. I really couldn't tell you what the next six years is going to look like because I couldn't tell you that I was going to be paying four dollars for a, a gallon of regular gas today. I mean, it's 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 wild. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. No. No. For sure. For sure. With Benny, though, I'm I'm super excited because he's actually trying to uh, get into Sergeant Major school, and I think that'd be so oh, cool. Oh, nice. Sergeant Major in the Legion, that'd be awesome. That's pretty badass. Pretty badass, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think okay. he's gonna do it. But oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I, and and just just to piggyback off what you said a second ago, like like um, you know, PJ doesn't like me talking politics, but the only thing I'll say is, is that you know, when you're in the military, though, it's hard not to be politically aware because like. It affects yeah. you like, on a day to day basis. So yeah, to um, some extent, yeah, for sure. To some extent. I mean, like I said, I, I don't I hate politics. I think it's yeah, a, a yeah. joke. But there's a couple of things that, you know, you kinda have to be aware as to what's going on because it does affect us in, in right. some way or another. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. And, and and maybe more so than civilians actually, because again you're, you're Yeah. Yeah. Because we're owned. I mean, for lack of a better word, we're we are owned by the government and, and regulated by certain things. That in the civilian world, you know, you don't really have to worry about. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Now with the with the animal side, now you're a huge animal lover, and you you've mentioned yes. you have horses, and and you've worked with like uh, all sorts of animals. You're a trainer, and then you're a yes. snake breeder as well. And snake breeding yes. seems to be a big thing in bodybuilding. Um, how did you get into all that? So I've worked with animals for the past, let's see, seventeen years, and um, that's actually how I met PJ and became part of the Legion was we had a common denominator, so to speak. Uh, we were discussing somebody, I'm not going to say a name, but we were dis discussing somebody that we both didn't like and thought that we liked in the beginning and started learning a little bit about that individual. And um, it was the love and passion that PJ has for iguanas. You know, he has a, I can't remember the name, but he has this iguana that like lives in his backyard and he talks to him and makes sure that, that he's okay and whatnot. Nice. So um, that's, that's actually how I became part of Legion. But my passion with animals has been since I was a little kid. I mean, uh, my parents were like, well, if you take care of it, you can keep it basically. So that's traveled into adulthood. And I started working with uh, Doc Antle, which was part of the Tiger King series. And um, worked with all kinds of stuff, tigers, lions, hyenas, leopards, cheetahs, you name it, I've had my hands on it, pretty much. Very cool. Very cool. And, and, and snakes, I mean, are there any particular types of snakes that you like, like pythons or like rattlers or like, are there any types that like, you don't mess with or venomous or whatnot? So I love reptiles in a whole. I mean, th actually, there's no animal that I don't like except for like roaches and shit like that. They, they can go away. But as far as snakes, I love pythons. Um, I use uh, ball pythons in my breeding. I have about a thousand of them. And I was actually one of the first females years ago when the program first came out to capture the invasive Burmese pythons. I was the first female permit holder and uh, to catch them and remove them from the Everglades, 
was working with South Florida Water Management, establishing how we wanted to structure the program. And um, that was really cool. And it, it was it was really interesting to work with them and, and try to establish areas and whatnot. And the program has changed a little bit. So I've kind of gotten out of it. And I wasn't here. I, I just got back this year. I've been gone for a little while. But I love the ball python. It's a nice snake. It's not super big, but it's not like a, a tiny little thing. And the color variations, we call them designer snakes because, I mean, you can throw out a Louis Vuitton color and then have just a black one. And, you know, it's a, so they're really diverse and it's a lot of um, like a genetics. You're, you're playing with the different genetics and trying to create something and, you know, seeing what does what with a, two different genetics and whatnot. Definitely. How much does it cost to feed a thousand snakes every month? So we actually feed the snakes every week. Um, the baby ones, we feed them twice a week so that they can grow and be in the breeding program faster. Uh, and that's probably about $700 for the first feeding and then another 200 to $300 on the second feeding. So we're doing about $1,000 a week for feeding. See me, I could never run snakes. I could never like, like do the live feeding thing. I couldn't do right. that. Kind of feel bad for the for the rats or whatever but like but yeah. they don't eat unless it's alive right they won't well no not necessarily i mean you can switch them on to um frozen and thawed but it's a lot easier if if the animal is alive because then you can see if the snake is going to go after it or not otherwise if you have ever left a rat in a snake cage for two three days it is the worst smell you will ever smell it in your life really yeah it's it's pretty awful especially when you have a thousand of them it's it can get pretty bad so it's it's nice to have a live mouse or rat throw it in there if the snake gets it great if not you just remove it out of it, the enclosure and is it only uh rodents that they eat or do they eat other things like i mean other oh. animals or other i mean they things? can eat basically anything that they can open their mouths to so the top jaw is pretty solid but the bottom jaw it, it can manipulate that's mm -hmm. how they use um like their fingers basically so that they can put the animal into their mouth but they can eat dogs they can eat chicken Jeez. they yeah i mean they can they can eat basically anything that's that's warm they'll strike at anything that has a, a heat radar to them they'll strike at and if they can fit it into their mouth they'll eat it so so there was an effort to remove them from the everglades or was that for preservation so, purposes or because they were like eating everything so they're they're invasive the burmese python it's it's still a continuing project they do like different uh, programs and they have contests and stuff which is really neat getting the the community involved in it but the Burmese python is an invasive animal so they're like oh that's because people buy them and they let them go because they get too big that may happen one in a million times but the actual cause of it is the importers so a long time ago we'd have importers they bring in these animals they're sick not doing well instead of throwing them in the garbage they just let them go they just, they'll just dump them in the back and so what ends up happening is that Miami has one of the best tropical climates for reptiles. Reptiles are cold-blooded animals, so they thrive in the warm and they would rehab themselves and then they would thrive. So basically what's happening, I've, I've always been an Everglades kid. I've spent a lot of time in the Everglades and we used to see these uh, small marsh rabbits. They're like these little brown, cute bunnies all over the place. And as the year started progressing and the Burmese python started going into the Everglades, you saw the number decreasing significantly. Mm -hmm. And it's the it's the pythons that's what they're eating they're getting so big because it's a massive animal i mean they can get 20 feet plus wow they're eating deer uh they're opportunist animals also there's a picture that went around for years of a alligator and a burmese python and the burmese python had eaten the alligator and then it exploded and that was because the alligator was dead it did not fight an alligator and eat it and kill it it saw it it must have been warm and he was an opportunist and he ate it well it was too big and the alligator was rotting i guess and it freaking exploded inside the snake and the snake ended up opening up and dying wow. but it's a major issue um there are still permit holders that go out and take the animals out of the everglades and there's different programs with fish and game and there's a program with the south Florida water management so it's 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 going to be this for like this forever. It's not something that us taking them out of the Everglades is actually going to solve the issue. Right. It's just going to bring down the numbers. And then the next breeding cycle, they don't lay two eggs, three eggs. They're laying like 20, 30 eggs. So right. 
let's say you have five animals out there that are laying 20, 30 eggs. Now you have a new hundred population. So it's going to be an ongoing project. Hopefully they can get their hands around it, but I don't see the end of that tunnel anytime yeah. soon. No, I figured it was something either for preservation or, or because they were like a nuisance or something like Asian carp, you know, Asian carp, uh, the, right. the, the, you know, the, the theory is, is that it came on the bottom of the barges from China and Asia and all that. And it somehow got into the Mississippi. Now they're eating everything. Everything. And, uh, yeah. Um, so like you said, like the, the hypo about, you know, like the one in a million could have happened once in a million, but more than likely it's what you said. It's the breeders not being responsible and just kind of. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So what's tiger king like i mean that that show just blew up everywhere i mean like were you it, like, it, or meet any of the people or so i actually lived and worked at the myrtle beach safari and i was there for a couple of years it was probably one of the greatest experiences um that i've ever had in my life i worked for doc Antle for seven years in total and lived at, in myrtle beach in south carolina for two years but i worked with him in miami because we did a show here and whatnot but I wasn't ready to move out of Miami because I am a huge Miami fan. It's friggin' not cold. I do not like the cold. And uh, I was like, oh, Myrtle Beach isn't gonna be so bad. No, it was, it was terrible, it's cold. Mm -hmm. um, but, so it sounds like they like to hump. Yeah, they, Burmese pythons, they definitely like to breed. I'm hearing that they need to take them out or they will take over the world. I wouldn't say that they'll take over the world. So uh, reptiles, are pretty smart animals, they're going to go to where food is. If they're in an area that there's no food, they're leaving. I'll just answer that question real quick. No, so, for sure. And, yep. um, back to Tiger King. So Tiger King, they came to the property and they first told us that they were going to do a documentary on tigers in captivity. Fine, okay. We've done a bunch of these. Nat Geo comes here all the time. You know, it's we're not doing anything that nobody doesn't know about. So come on, come on over. And they were there for about a year filming this tigers in captivity episode and um you know we were there with them and they were really nice the producers and whatnot and then they started asking very interesting personal questions and i was like you want to ask me something about my tiger cub or my cheetah or whatever it is that i have out that's great fantastic but when you start asking personal questions about somebody's relationship it kind of made me feel like where is this going what mm -hmm. what are you what are you trying to get to Right, no, for sure. Yeah. Once, once the episode came out, we were like, what? <laughs> you know, uh, okay, okay. And the funniest part about it was the timing that it came out. So COVID hit. Um, everybody was in quarantine and lockdown. And all of a sudden, it was like, hey, watch this thing on Netflix. And it was like, holy shit, it's at number one. And I didn't know that I had come out in it until I started watching it. And I was like, oh, my God, is this, is this good or bad? I'm not really sure. <laughs> not yeah. sure yet. Let's keep watching. But um, it is not a documentary. I will say that 100%. It is not a documentary. It was a drama series. And they take a lot of things out that don't tell you the whole story. Course, so yeah. there was a lot of things in that in the first Tiger King that were just whew, way, way off, way, way out of line. And um, but it it got their ratings up. So they were successful. And we were able to have interviews and, you know, explain our side of everything. So it, it all turned out for the best. And we're still up and running at Myrtle Beach. And so the animals are still there. It's probably one of the nicest animal facilities I've ever seen in my life. And not just because I'm part of the, the Myrtle Beach Safari team, but look at the pictures go there visit there you know people are like oh animals in captivity blah blah blah. we don't have our animals in cages we have our animals out with us they get to see new things they get to walk around experience stuff. So, you know you go to a zoo and you're like well that tiger looks terrible it's just sleeping tigers sleep 18 to 22 hours a day right how they do that i don't know but they do they do a couple things they breed they eat and they go to the bathroom what and then they eat. That, that's right. it. Yeah, that's it. So we take them out. We play with them. We do natural things that uh, tigers like to do. Like they love to swim. Doc is mm -hmm. kind and smart and helping the world. Yes, he definitely is. Uh, Doc is, is an, a very, a very amazing individual, I will say. Haven't mm -hmm. watched it yet. Would you recommend it? Uh, tiger King 1, 
if you want to watch a drama series, sure, go go for it. If you want uh, all kinds of different dramas and uh, characters, it's great. But if you're looking for a documentary, that that is not that's not it. That, well, I, I always tell people too, like Pumping Iron. If Pumping Iron would have just been about guys lifting in the gym, we wouldn't be talking about it 50 years later. So, right. um, not, I'm not justifying what they did, but I'm just saying, like it, it to get hits, to get ratings, whatever you want to call it, you gotta sometimes you gotta, you gotta stretch it. the truth a little bit. You gotta you gotta stretch Which it. You gotta you gotta film lines. something. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You got yeah. you gotta film something and then take out the parts that make it sound too good. You have right. to make it sound, you know, juicy and, and whatnot. So uh, it, it was it was wild. We had that one female that came on uh, and she was talking about how she lived in in a barn or she lived in something and it had bars on the windows. But if you looked at the scene before that, they're driving down the street saying, oh, these are all of all of the uh, keepers houses and stuff. And it was like, I hope right. that people are putting this together. You know, like, yeah. hopefully not. Hopefully not. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you also you also have horses, right? Like, are you into the like? Yes, I have two horses myself. Um, my mom has horses as well, and um, I've had a pony. I, I know it sounds funny, but yes, I've had a pony. I'm small, and he's small. And when we take a picture together, we both look normal size, so it works out perfect. Um, I've had him for 14 years now, and I just recently got a rescue horse. Someone left him there at the barn, abandoned him. He was very traumatized, very aggressive. And uh, if you see us together, we kind of look like we've known each other our entire lives. And he just is very subtle about everything. And he's really sweet. And I've had him now for three months. And he's he's freaking doing great. So it's been good. Definitely. What, what's the, I, I, there's no like um, short answer to this, but, but how do you deal with an aggressive horse, especially because you don't know what this poor animal's been through. If he was abandoned, that might right. have been the least of his troubles. So how- Correct. I, I, you know, I've heard the term break a horse. I don't like that because it seems like you're right. using a, a hostility horse. against an already right. angry animal. So how do you? So the term breaking a horse is, is totally okay. Um, it okay. translates more into like the, the olden days you would, it was called breaking their spirit. And I, it, it does sign, sounds kind of barbaric, but it's, mm -hmm. it translates into horses are just, they just want to run around and do their own thing. But you are able to create a relationship with them and you're able to let them understand that, hey, what we're doing can be fun and rewarding. So with this animal in particular, I had to do everything very, very slowly. So the abandonment issue was, yes, it was this big compared to everything else. Um, they tried moving the animal before they abandoned him and they were trying to get him into a trailer. He was freaking out and panicking, and one of the women that was there started whipping him, trying to get him into the trailer. Yeah, and he slipped from the trailer, and he cut his hocks, which is like the part that connects, kind of like the ankle area, and completely slashed his ankles and was bleeding all over the place. She got really frustrated and threw him into a saw. So the owner of the property came out and was like, what the hell is going on? And she's like, oh, well, this stupid animal doesn't want to load, blah, blah, blah. And she was like, well, I think you should just go, you know? So the that woman came the next day and she tried to get him again. And the owner came out and she's like, listen, it obviously didn't work yesterday. He's got scars and bleeding all over the place. And I think that you should probably just leave the animal here. So the original owner of the animal was like, yeah, that's probably the best bet, you know, and we'll just see what we're going to do. We'll see what we're going to do. They left the animal there. They never came back to see him. And the barn owner decided that she was going to keep him on the property, which this happens sometimes. People don't want to pay their barn fees. And they're just like, you know what? Just keep the horse. I'm not really into this anymore. And unfortunately, the one that suffers is the animal. So to me, if you have an animal, it is your sole responsibility to do everything for that animal if you're going to keep it in, in captivity. You know, in the wild, if they die, that's because that's that's that animal. If it dies in your care because of something that you have neglected, then that's 100 percent, you know, your fault. You probably shouldn't have that animal anymore. But uh, he's doing really good. He was extremely skinny. His hair is all broken. His mane is all a disaster. He's got scars all over his body. He's just a very... Uh, good-hearted horse but because of the things that he's been through um she couldn't even brush his tail he would try to kick her he they couldn't pick his feet he'd turn around and bite her if he was if she was riding 
I mean, there was a lot of uh, psychological things that I had to slowly say, hey, buddy, you know, this is okay. I'm not going to hurt you. And by the second day, he was like, we're cool. We're friends. And um, I was actually working him so that the barn owner could sell him. And by the second ride, I like fell in love with him. And I was like, this course does everything. And they're like, yeah, he has a lot of training. It's just that he is he he is psychologically bruised right now. So right. you just have to work through those things. And he's really done good. Um, there's a FIU pre-vet course that comes out to the barn and they do um, horse husbandry and they learn how to handle horses and whatnot. And they came out and I didn't tie him. I just told him to stay there. And he did, which was pretty amazing. And people that know that the animal were like, what the hell? He's doing so good. And I was like teaching him how to brush the horse and whatnot. And it's funny because he would turn around, you know, pin his ears, which was a, a first sign of an aggressive horse. And we worked through it and everything was okay. But he's just scared of people is basically what it is. You know, people hurt me. People have done this, that, and the other. I don't trust them. But for whatever reason, he, he picked me. And I believe that animals do pick their, their people. And um, he's doing great. He's, we went on our first trail ride uh, last weekend. And he was first, last, in the middle, by the cars, you know, in the puddles. So it was, I was really, it was a proud mom moment for me. Cool. It was, yeah, it was, it was a, a successful ride. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. I mean, yeah, and, and you know, because, uh, like I said, abandonment was probably the least of his problems. But, and, yeah, and everything sure. described, and there's probably a lot more. And it's just great that, that you have that connection with him and that you're keeping him too. And, you know, because, I mean, my gosh, like uh, uh, James Mulder had pointed out earlier, uh, asking you how much it costs to feed snakes. And now we're talking about horses. These are all very, very expensive uh, uh, yeah. animals to keep. I mean, uh, right. horses, like just uh, the hay alone that they eat. I mean, and then the stall fees. And it's just, it's, it's insane. You know, it's, it's one of those things. And I laugh because it's like, I always say, I have one butt. How am I going to ride two horses, you know? But um, the pony's getting older, and so I don't, I don't demand from him as much. He used to be a, a hunter jumper, which is, you know, the, the ones that jump fences. Right. He's a little guy, but he will jump a four-foot fence, no problem. And he's never told me no. But as he's getting older, I don't ask him those things anymore. You know, if we play around and there's something on the ground, we'll jump it, you know, just for fun. Right. But so the new one, he's 13, which is a nice prime age for a horse it's not too old it's not too young you know he's already got his headset properly aside from the things that we have to work on but overall he's a he's a really good animal and um it is very expensive and i was like i really don't need this horse and the owner was like he doesn't get along with anyone you have to keep him and i was like okay and i eventually convinced myself and i was like all right all right buddy you're part of the pack and um putting horses together is like putting two dogs together. You have a dog, you go adopt another one, they hate each other. Now what do you do? Well, my pony has actually never been with other horses. He's always kind of done his own thing. He's very independent. He's, he's a cat more than anything. And uh, so I bring this other horse around and put them together. And was, I was like ready to referee and, and break up a fight. Well, these two just decided that they were best friends right off the bat. And I was like, this is just, ever heard of it was meant to be? It was friggin' meant to be, so that that's all going really well. Hopefully, I'll see them today because it's been raining all friggin' day over yeah. here. You're yeah. in Florida, right? I am. I'm down in Homestead actually, and yeah. uh, I go feed them on the weekends every morning and clean their stalls and everything. But today has just been a downpour, unfortunately. Yeah, I haven't been down there that much. I grew up in North Miami Beach, and I do remember there was a lot of horses like in Miami Lakes, but Homestead, of course, as well, and. All of yeah. Florida, so Ocala, especially, my gosh, oh. okay, like University of Florida, Ocala is like it. Right. So. That's horse world, for sure. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Well, listen, I, I really want to thank you for doing this. And, Absolutely. Uh, freaking out a little bit because I, was, I wasn't sure we were going to connect because like Instagram yeah. is just so bizarre sometimes. Um, I do have something oh. called Catching Up, so maybe in a few months we can do like a catch. I've only done one with Marathon Mom, but you know, maybe we uh -huh. can do a Catching Up or something like yeah, that. Yeah, Absolutely. That awesome. would be awesome. Thanks for having me on, Chris. I really Definitely. appreciate it. Definitely. All right. so for, and thanks, guys, Cecil. for watching. Yes, yes. Thank you for watching. I'm going to say your name correctly for Cecil Schneebly. 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 Cecil Schneebly. You got it. It's so important, guys. It's so important to say someone's name correctly. <laughs> so for Cecil Schneebly, this is yes. Christian Duke, strengthaddicts.com. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye-bye.